Okay, well, we pray together bef uh, before we take up our further study on the book of Ephesians. Well, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the many lessons that we can learn from the Scriptures, but we also thank you for the many lessons that you impress upon our hearts in life too, in our personal life, in the life of the church. We pray that as we see you working and continuing to build Bethel, may our hearts be encouraged further. We pray that you would continue to build. Help us to discover our part in the body of Christ. We pray that you would bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we've had the opportunity to read the Gospels, right? So we, we will go back to it, don't worry. Okay, so we, we read the Gospels. And the Gospels is what the Lord Jesus Christ taught. Who He is, uh, what He taught. Uh, remember, the disciples were there. There were lessons that they were to learn for life, for ministry. Now, then the book of Acts, we see in the book of Acts, the disciples carrying on, right? So we see this in, this is narrative, this is very much like narrative too. We, we see this, this, the, this, this is, we'll be looking at this in the, the you know, pulpit messages. And the key person there is the Holy Spirit, right? Working in the lives of the uh, apostles and the disciples. Now, then we look at, at Sunday school, uh, this, these are the, called the epistles, the pastoral letters, the writings of the apostles, in particular Paul's study. Now, how do we fit them all together? Right? So, the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, who He is, right? Uh, yeah, they are recorded. And then the book of Acts, we see the disciples, we see the apostles following. And you look at what they do. All the things that they are doing is what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Now, how do you put it all together that it may be relevant for everybody? This is where the epistles came in. So this is helpful because it forms what we call a set of doctrines for us to work with. Right? That's how we can have a, a good set of you know, framework that we can say this, we can work with this, and it helps us to know that we are on the right track. Right? We check with the teachings of the apostles, we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, we look at the book of Acts, and then we look at, and then we cross-reference all the time. So this is what we are attempting to do. Then it gives us a very, very good set of framework to work with as we look at the church. When problem comes, okay, now what do we do? Right? We go back to the scriptures. Right. Now, how do we grow the church further? We go back to the scriptures. Right? So, always check with these three things, the Gospels, the Book of Acts, the, the Epistles. And then that is a very good set of, you know, er, uh, scripture that we can work with. Okay? At a, at a basic level. Now, we have been looking at, um, in this particular part, uh, Paul has been writing and teaching about quite a bit on the gifts part of it. Okay? So we've been looking at how the Lord gives to uh, those who are His children, gives to believers gifts, spiritual gifts. So we mustn't think that we don't have anything. Every child of God have a gift or more. Much depends on our faith. Much, remember, according to the measure of Christ, according to His measure, and it also according to the measure of our faith. Both sides. So it's good that we understand how these gifts 
uh, are utilized. Okay, just, just a bit of a review. So Ephesians 4, part of it, right? So we have been uh, studying this part uh, with reference to spiritual gifts. Okay, so God has given to all His children gifts. How do we understand that? Because we are His children, we are heirs and heirs of Christ, this is actually part of our inheritance. Okay, so the inheritance part has been given. There is, it's been, um, it includes heaven, yes, but it's not just only in heaven you receive. That inheritance includes the present. Now that's interesting, right? So Paul talks about gifts as part of that inheritance. Okay, because the Lord Jesus Christ has died and rose again. And that inheritance is given to those who are his followers, who are his disciples, those who are his. Right? They are given out of grace, of course. They are given through faith in Christ and they are given in measure according to the Lord's will. Right? So that's what we... Just, just a bit of a recap. This would be Ephesians um, <clears throat> 1 to... All the way to 3. Okay? So uh, 1 to 4, sorry. Uh, 1 to 4. So this part of it. Now, we come and ask, what is the purpose of these gifts that are given? We know God has given these gifts but what is the purpose? So we come to the part where Paul talks about, uh, teaches about the purpose of it all. And this is found in verse 11 all the way to 16. Right? And so the Lord gives gifts, and you will see the word edify come out a lot. Okay? So these gifts is to edify us. And this is a beautiful word, the word edify. Okay, what does it mean to be edified? Right? To be edified is um, the, the actual, the, the, the word in Greek is to, it, it, it talks about like a builder. No? <laughs> it talks about like a builder coming to build up something to strengthen it until you see this is a very strong house. That's, that's the word edify. It's a beautiful, beautiful word. Paul uses it quite a bit. You've got to see this come up again and again. So, you know, these gifts are given to us that in very much in a way, personally, we may be edified. Our life, our own life, our spiritual life. Right? Our faith can be edified, our life can be edified, and you see a Christian that is well built up, in other words. This is the purpose of spiritual gifts. Now, the context is also the church. As individuals, we come together and we are part of the body of Christ that the church would be edified. It will be built up. It will be strengthened. Now, that is the purpose. So, God is the one, remember, the one who plans. He plans which gift to give who? Not us. Right? He is the one who is the provider of these gifts. They are His. And of course, therefore, he is the one who knows this is the purpose of it all. Right? So these are spiritual gifts that the Lord has obviously planned for and He's going to provide and then the purpose. Now, Paul is going to uh, explain these, the purpose of these gifts given to the church. 
Now, uh, the, this is, this is um, really interesting because he now goes and talks about the people whom God has raised up as part of that gift. Right? So the gifts become part of who you are. Now, he uh, makes a list of people first to start off with. Now, let's take a look at verse 11. So these are gifts that God has given to the church. They are the Lord's gift. And we read in verse 11. He himself... Uh, this is trying to make a real emphasis. This is He himself is how uh, Paul is trying to emphasize that it is the Lord himself who does this. Right? They are not appointed, as it were, it is not a come out of man's idea. It's He himself. The Lord himself was the one who gave some to be apostles some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some pastor teachers. Now, they are all different. And yet, they fulfill the same purpose. And that purpose is to build His church. Right? So, this is a list of servants given, of God given to the church. God, the apostles were there. We read about them in the book of Acts. The prophets, you, you may not know this, but there were actually prophets there too. They did not play a prominent role like in the days of the Old Testament. But in the book of Acts, there were prophets. Some of them were mentioned. Right? But there they were. Now, there were also um, evangelists. One more famous one, his name is called Philip. Right? If you read the, the, uh, Acts 8, you, you read about him and that boy was this man and an evangelist. See, where did he begin? He began as serve tables. Very humble work. Right? Uh, later on, we will read uh, uh, how he began. But there he was, chosen because this was a person full of the Holy Spirit. This was a person... Uh, you know, God's wisdom was certainly there. Good reputation. That's where they all begin. But where he began and what he became, not the same. What did he become? A great evangelist for the Lord's work. And God sent him. Now, remember, he's not apostle. Okay? So we mustn't think only the apostles. There, there's a whole team of people that were there. Now, there was Philip the evangelist, and he was a very, very good evangelist too. Okay, so there the evangelist, and some pastors, pastors, teachers. So the word pastor, teachers are together. They are not separate. What is a pastor? A pastor is also a teacher. Okay, so to, to distinguish, this is not just your usual Sunday school teacher. This is not just a lay teacher. These are the shepherds of the church. The pastor teaches. So a pastor must be able to teach the Lord's Word, must give himself to teach the Lord's Word. It's not a uh, separate thing. So they are put together, pastor teaches, uh, as it were. Okay, so they, uh, all together, they were given to build the church. Wow. Well, what was the role of the prophets? They all, remember, they all say purpose, but they all fulfilled different roles. Right? So we have the apostles, we have the prophets, we have the evangelists, we have the pastor, uh, teachers, PT, personal trainer. <laughs> right? So if you take a look at Ephesians chapter 2, then Paul distinguishes these roles quite a bit, right? So Ephesians 2, just, just, a, just for, we've already read this, but just to go back and reference it a little, he tells them, look at this, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Of course, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. But the work of the apostles and the prophets were foundation. 
foundational work. Right? They were to put everything together. So the teachings uh, in the book of Acts is called the doctrine of the apostles, for example. The doctrine of the apostles. So what the church is, what the church needs to become, all the things, there's a set of foundation. It has already been laid by the apostles and the prophets, right? The chief of it all, cornerstone, is Christ, obviously, right? Now, the uh, evangelists, pastor teachers, you build on this foundation. You don't go and build on another foundation. <laughs> so this is what we do. We, well, I'm called pastor teacher, right? Do I do the work of evangelism too? Yes, right? We go and share the gospel. Uh, right? We share the gospel with the aged care. We share the gospel. Every time we give it a chance to share the gospel, we do the work of an evangelist. Right? And so, wow, well, people come for funeral ministry, uh, funeral and, and that. So, just talking to the family members. And you know, they, they said the guests who came, and they said how they uh, saw a different side of what the church is. Uh, there are people who don't usually go to church. And they came, they saw, they heard, they felt. They said, this is nice, this is beautiful. Right? It's so personal, it's so relevant. And this is a work of evangelists too. Evangelists is <laughs> breathing fire, brimstone, yelling at people, hey, not evangelists. Philip was a very good evangelist. You should read about him. He's very personal. He came alongside. People ask him questions. Now, from the book of Isaiah, he explained Christ. Oh, wow, that is not easy to do. But that's a very good evangelist, right? So what do they do? They build on this foundation, right? So that is, you see, a very complete, a very, very complete thing uh, over here. So now, okay, so this is their roles and their part. And their purpose is to build the church. How do they do that? Now, let's go back to Ephesians uh, 4, and we see Paul explaining this. In the book of Acts, we just see the disciples multiplied. But here, we see how it was done. Okay? And, and so we read in uh, verse 11, uh, then verse 12, for this is purpose. Okay? God, the Lord gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Now, this is the purpose of it all. Verse 12, for, for this purpose, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of of the body of Christ, right? So when we see a series of what is used as a purpose clause, just a simple clause, for, this is the purpose. For the equipping of the saints, for the purpose of the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all come to the unity of faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, kind of a thing. Right? We'll go through them and I'll ask ourselves what it means, but can we see the idea here of Paul? He's very, very mythological, explaining. Okay, the, the, the teachings, all the, the foundation has been laid. Now, pastor teachers, they build on this foundation. They teach what the apostles taught and they utilize what they have been taught to equip believers. The saints are believers. Right? These are people who are called saints because we are made holy through our faith in Christ. That's what it is. So the saints of God is not a special group of Christians. It, no. it is the believers who make up the church. They are called the saints of God. Right? So the saints in Ephesus, the saints in uh, Philippi, 
that, that's who they are. But believers, we need to be equipped. That's the first part of it. Okay? So in order to edify, first, we need to be equipped. Now, there's quite a bit here. Yeah, and, and you can ask questions at any point in time. Okay? So, like, it's almost like a process. So, first, it doesn't begin with edify, but it, be, it really begins with the word uh, to equip. And the word to equip, it's a very interesting word. Uh, it's found in the Gospels. It's the idea of uh, mending fishing nets. Remember when the Lord Jesus Christ came and called His disciples? They were mending the fishing uh, nets. The same word is now used by them to describe what it means to be a disciple. Right? When you mend there's the fishing net, they have to mend because sometimes there's a hole there uh, caused by the fish. They need to take it, they have to examine it, they need to mend it, strengthen it, restore it, then it can be useful again. But that's what it means to be equipped. It includes exactly what Jesus did in the disciples' life. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Wow, you are like a net that the Lord is going to mend. He's going to restore. He's going to correct. He's going to strengthen until you are like a net that can catch fish. But in this case, fishes of men. That was a very, very powerful image that the apostles actually retained. Right? Because this word equip, there are many different words, but why choose this word? They kept what Jesus had in mind, which is wonderful. Right? So equipping of the saints, this is the idea of why they called disciples. Make disciples of all men, kind of a thing. Right? So as they come, first the person come to faith in Christ, they, they're very convicted, they, you know, they repent of their sins, and they come to become a believer. The Lord Jesus is our, my Savior. That's wonderful. Now, where do I go from here? Well, you need to be equipped. You still lack a lot of knowledge. You need to be instructed. Right? There are things in life that need to be corrected. Right? For the disciples, many things. They were very much Jewish. So they think Jewish. They breathe Jewish. Very much, all cultural things are very much in place. And the Lord had to teach. They had to correct. Even the way they read the scriptures is a very Jewish way. Very legalistic, very wooden literal. And so the Lord taught them how to read it correctly. And while well, the Lord Jesus took three years, and out of it, they, people began to realize they have been with Christ. But that continued. The apostles laid the foundations for people, teach the people, equip the people, and that's how they were able to serve the Lord like the Lord Jesus taught His disciples to serve. Right? So this is important. We see the word here, equipping of the saints. Right, The first four. For first, this is their role, to equip. Okay, well, I need to be equipped. I really need to be equipped. I have come to faith in Christ. Wonderful. Right Now, I really need to grow my knowledge of the Lord. I really need to be involved. I need to serve. I need to be part of it. Otherwise, how to learn? That's how the disciples learned too. They were instructed. They were sent out. They had to experience what it is. Right? Because theory and practice, not the same. Okay, so my son has been... I said, what is the highlight of this? They just finished school, so, right, Sylvester. The highlight of the whole Sylvester. And it's got nothing to do with school. <laughs> He and his friends wants to set up a lemonade stand. And so, you know, business, this is serious. You know, group of them, group of friends, there's a business plan. 
there is a, you know, how the recipe, how they're going to do it. Everything so far, they've spent literally weeks, you know, over a month, last part of it, and they want to do it in the school holiday. I said, great. So I asked, where's the venue? I said, well, okay, we're going to, big ambitions. They want to go to the farmer's market. They're going to set up the, the store there. I said, okay, but you must talk to, the, talk to the person because whether they let you or not. I said, okay, no problem. He's, she, he's got to go. So James followed me uh, first last, uh, last Saturday. The guy wasn't there. Okay. This Saturday, the guy was there. So he's got all these plans going. He's even thinking about how to expand his business already. He's, uh, the profits will be utilized to buy a portable lemon maker, to, lots of things. And then I said, well, first step, you haven't even got a venue. You have to ask for permission. Go talk to the guy. So I was standing there. Go, go and talk to the guy. So he went, hi, I'm James. Uh, me and my friends wants to set up a lemonade store in the farmer's market. <laughs> the guy looks at him said, actually, it's really complicated. You have to get permit, you have to have insurance, you have to have this. It's not like, but they were, they, they saw his face sunk, you know. <laughs> yeah, they said, it's not like years ago where you can just set up a lemonade store everywhere, but you have to have all these things in place and uh, I think suddenly he saw his world fell apart. All the planning and all that. And I'm there. And of course, I, I, let him experience it. This is the real part. And they said, you've got a great idea. And he's trying to think about how to help him. But he says, look, you, you won't be able to set up a store here because it costs money for permit, money for insurance. You've got to have this, you've got to have that. And suddenly... He realized, to his horror, is not going to be easy. So, wow, that became a conversation. Okay, now, um, okay, that didn't work. What can we do? What can we do? See, in our mind, serving the Lord, very easy. You try. <laughs> in our mind. There will be problems, there will be challenges, there will be things that you have not encountered. That's exactly why Jesus sent them to the field. And they will learn. They will learn to speak. They will learn to encounter uh, oppositions. They will encounter problems. They will encounter this. They will encounter that. And they had to learn. Right? Don't give up. Don't, oh, yeah, this ministry is not for me, therefore. No, that's where you come back. You have to face these things and you learn. The equipping of the saints was not just done in... Knowledge must be there, of course. But it was done in real time, in real life. For the work of ministry. You've got to do the work of ministry. A lot of students in the year 12, they study very, very hard. And then they get a very good ATAR score. And then they go to uni, and then I don't know what to do. What do they do? Take a gap year, because they have no idea what to do. They have been just focusing on the theory and no practical. At all. What do you want? What are you studying for? For the work of ministry. Unless you go out there and involve yourself in service, you learn very differently. Right? I mean, you've experienced funeral ministry this week, some of you. You were there, you served alongside. Right? You were there for the family. It's very special, isn't it? And then suddenly you see the whole idea of God's Word coming alive to being there, to love, to compassion, to see His presence there. It's so different when you are actually doing it for the work of ministry. You cannot say, okay, I want to grow. I'm going to go down there and equip me. Equip you for what? For the work of ministry. So right now, we are equipping three of them to run the youth camp. We say, you want to grow your faith? I'll show you how. You serve. 
Huh? <laughs> so that's how you learn. You learn to pray like you never prayed before. You learn to depend on the Lord's grace. And this morning, the three of them, that all three confess at the start, we're not speakers. We're not people who are, who are given to public speaking. We'll be speaking publicly, chairing the whole service. This is part of equipping. This is our ministry. This is how we can edify the church and build up the church. It's a process. We all want the church to grow and to grow strong. Right, but how do you do it? <laughs> you have to do this. You have to win people to God. The people who come to faith in Christ, what do you do with them? You have to equip. Right? There are people who are still haven't come to faith in Christ. Nothing can be done because they don't have the Spirit of God. Because the Lord is not real to them. Nothing can be done until they are people who are called saints. Not because they are, wow, they are so saintly. No, that's not what it is. It's just a reference to believers. It's a reference to God is the one who put His righteousness in their life. He will, he's in the process of making them holy. These are the ones we need to equip. Right? So at the youth camp, I actually do two things, actually. Two main things on all youth camp ministry. One is the work of evangelism. <laughs> Reaching out to those who don't know the Lord yet, the young people. Once upon a time, that was Banksia. Once upon a time, that was uh, the others who are there. And now, it's to equip. To do the work of evangelism, preach, share the gospel with them, and then uh, those of them who come, they are equipped further for life, for ministry. This is where it is an absolute vital ministry of the church. Right? That we pray much for, gear much for towards, because we need to do this work. Otherwise, how will Bethel grow further? You can pray till the cow come home. If you do nothing about it, nothing's going to come out too. Right? So I can pray for my son. May he learn all these things. I'm going to get, you know, have a shot. Do it. Hit some problems. Now let's work it out. We got to be equipped. Right? So this is part equipping. So this was what Paul taught. Equipping for the work of ministry. Now, for. So you got to see the connection. For, for, for. Purpose. The purpose clause is used very skillfully by Paul here. He connects it all together, right? Uh, for the edifying of the body of Christ, right? You keep doing it until now, and there's the word till. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. When the church moves as one, that is a very strong church. Ah, that's a very lofty goal, actually. When there is this kind, when we all, the whole church, there is unity of faith. That's goal. Till. Don't stop until this happens. <laughs> right? In other words, until we all come to the unity of the faith and Knowledge of the Son of God. Wow, that is another very lofty goal. Paul really has lofty goals for the church. Till we all come to that knowledge of knowledge of understanding of who Christ is. <laughs> that is huge. That is really, really huge. Right? All, not just some, all. All of us to be able to know the Gospels well, to all of us to be able to know the writings of Paul to ex who have explained who the Lord Jesus Christ is and more. Till, don't stop till this happens, right? And then uh, we go on. Okay, so one, unity of faith, knowledge of the Son of God, and two, a perfect man. Right? So what is this to a perfect man? We need to explain this a little bit. To a perfect man. 
Um, this does not mean you become sinless. Okay, that's not, that's not what it is. Until you become a perfect human being, there is no perfect human being. We will never be perfect human beings. Right? That's not what um, it is. Remember, when we come to faith in Christ, we are born again. Peter calls it, we are babes in Christ. Spiritual. Right? Hungering, desiring the pure milk of God. That's when you are born again. We need to grow. How do you grow the pure milk of the Word of God? Until you become complete, mature. This is become a man. In other words, you've grown up from baby to adulthood. There is a long process. This is Paul's way of talking about spiritual maturity. Right? Uh, he explains it to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be like children. Yes, children are vulnerable. That's why there are laws protecting children. You're not going to give a, okay, make a decision about your life 10 years old. You can't. Who do you want to marry? They will tell you who they want to marry. Right? At five years old, they all want to say, ah, you I still remember the kids telling us, can, we marry, can I marry mom? <laughs> They're so cute, you see, because they love mom, mom does everything, I want to marry mom. Yeah, don't have an eye clue what that is all about. Kids, right? This is why we, there are laws to protect children. They're vulnerable, they're so innocent, <laughs> until they start growing up. But we cannot be Christians who are like children, immature uh, you know, not, not, not sharp, not wise, naive, then we are in trouble. This is what Paul says. We got to grow, grow to spiritual maturity, comparing don't be like children to a perfect man. So you take the two together. This is called maturity. We need to individually and as a church become spiritually mature. And it's not just by time alone. Time is an opportunity to learn. Time is given as an opportunity. But time itself does not tell you the person has matured. Right? Maturity is something that we actually have to develop. And the maturity, a mature Christian will reflect Christ. The um, uh, and he says, the stature of the fullness of Christ. We would reflect the Lord. Right? We cannot, we may not be able to reflect Him individually, every part, but we can reflect Him in measure. Heart, his heart of love, His heart of compassion, His heart of wisdom. Maybe not 100% like Christ, but by measure. But we work towards maturity. These are lofty goals, but they are not unobtainable goals, is what Paul is saying. Right? They are wonderful goals, and this is what we want to gear towards uh, very much. He says, this as a church, now that we, you know, we understand what a church is, we understand our salvation, this is what God has done for us, He's given us grace, He's given us mercy, He's supplied us with the Holy Spirit, He's given us gifts. What's all this about? Well, let's, let's do this. Let's build His church. Right? How we need to equip. We need to be equipped for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till now. These are goals. All these are goals. Keep doing it. Keep equipping people. Keep leading. Do the work of evangelism. Uh, evangelist, sorry. Uh, leading people to the Lord and equipping until we, uh, you know, others are able to be equipped until we see this in the church. Right? Now, of course, he expressed deep concerns for those who are not equipped. We will see uh, them tossed to and fro, carried away about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men by the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Now, that is the danger. 
if a church is spiritually not mature, it can be led astray by false teaching. Right? Yeah, people can come in, they impress you with their credential, they impress you with their eloquence, and they can lead the church astray. Paul uh, wanted to make sure the church does not go that way. Right? And so, verse 15, speaking the truth in love. Now, this is what we call application. Right? The concern is there. The great challenge is for all of us to apply these truths to ourselves. How do we put this into practice, what we have learned today? Right? God has given to us truly. Thank God for the apostles. Thank God for the prophets. What they have written are treasures. They are truly more precious than gold. Right? What are these for? Well, the pastor teachers have got to teach them. They've got to equip. They've got to equip their, the, the people in the church for the work of ministry that they may be able to edify and build the church. Until all these things are met, the unity there, when people are united in their faith, you are going to do much more. Right? Same heart, same soul we see in the book of Acts, and they attempted much more. Now, knowledge is needed, obviously. Uh, maturity is needed, obviously. Otherwise, the church can be open to all kinds of attacks. False teaching can come in, wrong doctrines can come, people get carried away, they can be deceived. Now, that is uh, obviously important. Okay. But the challenge is, how do we apply all these things? And then Paul uh, puts there three things. One, speaking the truth in love. Now That is what we can do. How do, can we attempt this? Now we must be challenged to communicate these truths in the spirit of love, right? Sincere love, not, not plotting, not deceit, not craftiness, none of those things which false teachers will employ, but just speaking the truth with a heart of love. Now, that is important. Now, uh, two, grow. Now, that we may grow up in all things into Him, who is the head. So three things if we are to apply what we are learning today. One, um, let truth be something that we will stand for and, and speak in, in love. Right? So we will speak the truth at all the services that we are able to conduct. What do we want to communicate with people? Truth from God, truth from His Word. And we will do it in the spirit of love. Right? That's our challenge, to apply what we are reading, what we are studying. Two, well, grow. Personally grow. Now, grow up, that's the word. That you will grow up in all things. And there are so many areas we need to grow in. We need to grow in our mind, we need to grow in our character, we need to grow in our faith, we need to grow in... The youth camp ministry is add to your faith. It's all about growing. Right? There is a warning for those who don't grow that Peter gives. And he warns because he was part of the problem in the past. And he realized when you don't grow, you, it, it could be really, you could hinder yourself quite badly. And so ever since then, he would encourage people to grow. Grow up in all things, right? Into Him, into Christ, in other words. Who is the head? He's the leader. He's the one who will lead us, right? Have more of the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. We grow into Him, into the Lord, into His ways, into His truth, into Him. 
right? That sum everything, who is the head, Christ. And then verse 16, from whom, the whom is with reference to the Lord, the whole body is a reference to the church, joined and knit together by every, but what every joint supplies, right? According to the effective working by which every part does its share, cause growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, three things. One, let's stand for truth. Let's speak the truth in love. Two, let's grow. Okay, this week we will, uh, Pastor Charlie will be over. What is the purpose of it all? To grow. He's already sent over what he's going to teach. And that's going to be, I'm, I'm just wondering how he's going to do it because he's going to teach all the kingdom parables in three nights. <laughs> I won't attempt that. <laughs> oh, it, takes, it takes him to attempt something like that. Grow. I'm challenged to grow further in my understanding of the kingdom of God this time round from the kingdom parables. Right? So, Grow. And then, of course, can we be part of it? Be an integral part of it, right? Integral part of the church. You are part of the church. Like, joint and knit together. That is being part of it. Now we ask ourselves, how are we part of the church and its ministries? Are we part of the youth camp ministry, in our prayers for the people, in our support given, in our, if you can, time given to support the youth camp ministry. Right? And so, um, Aldine said, a lot of people have signed up, 30, but he, she said, I have a problem. <laughs> I don't have a team to cook for the camp. I say, send out, send out a call. Go ahead and send out to all who would be, will be part of it. Give people a chance to say, you know what, I'm going to be part of it. And that's wonderful to see people respond, you know what, I'm going to be part of it. I'm gonna, you will feel, when you're part of it, you feel, yeah, you know, I'm part of the camp. You may not be the preacher, teacher, but you are part of feeding them, which is also wonderful because <laughs> they need to eat, especially young people. Right? Well, you will be there to really encourage the heart of Eldin too, that she, her hands don't drop off to cook for 30 people uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Right? I can't help her do this one now because I have to give my attention to prayer and the Word of God. Right? Integral, that is at every point. That's what Paul is saying. You don't want, you don't just look at this and say, wow, great idea. But how do we apply it? We are the one joint, knit together, every joint supply according to the effective working. We would work effectively if we are part of it, right? The church will work more effectively if we are going to be part of it, uh, if Every part does its share, cause growth to the body. What is our part? Can I ask, what is our part? What is your share in God's work? For the church. Really, what is it? Are you the one who are able to support? that support. If God has given you gifts, what are those gifts? Well, I think if anything that Uncle Clive has taught us this last month, few months, God has given to us the gift of time and opportunity. Don't waste it. That has left a very deep mark in my heart. Very, very deep mark in my own heart. It's, this is like loud and clear what God is trying to say to us.
through his testimony, through his time here. Time and opportunity. That is a gift. Don't waste it. Right? Let's do something. Okay? So this is uh, a chapter that we, we can look about. We talk about spiritual gift. We, we look at all these things. Let's apply them. These are truths. Let's, let's speak the truth in love. Let's grow so much more in our knowledge, in our understanding, in our faith, in our spirit. Grow. Grow. Be challenged to grow. Be part of it. Be an integral part, joint and knit together. And when we can, it will cause growth of the body, the edifying of itself. The church will build up itself in love. Right? That's what God is seeking to do. When Jesus said, I will build my church, He is involved in our heart, in our life, in the heart and life of all who know and love Him. We all have different parts to play. The apostles and the prophets have done their part. As pastors, we have our part. Believers, you have your role. Fulfill that too. And you will see the church grow stronger. Okay? All right, any questions you want to raise up? Anything you want to interact with uh, at, at all on this uh, study over here? Uh, to be, this is... Paul is, just thank God for his teaching because he just breaks it down in very practical steps that we can actually work with on all these things. Right? For an, anyone you want to uh, look at and ask anything you wish. Um, about the uh, gifts that God gives, about spiritual gifts, about any, any things that we have discussed, or other things if you wish to, to, to raise up. Um, be happy to uh, interact with you since we have a bit of time. All right. A many one. A good question to ask is what is my part? What is my part? What is your part? That was a question I have been asking for the long time when I came to faith in Christ. I was asked, Lord, you saved me out of grace and love. I mean, surely you didn't save me to take up a spot in the pew, come to church, sing some songs and go home. What is my part? What is my part? What is my uh, role? What is, uh, what is my purpose of being saved? What do I need to do? Well, I knew what I need to, be, what to do. I need to be equipped. And so I gave much of my youth as a young person to being equipped since I came to faith in Christ at 18. Much of it was equipping. Till my young adults, I learned to serve with, you know, equipping and serving went hand in hand to my young adults' years. I, I, I cried out to the Lord because I was so ill-equipped. I didn't have the knowledge, didn't have the anything. So one day I said to Pastor Charlie, I wouldn't mind taking one year off work. I really don't. To go over to Bethany, you equip me. Please equip me. I feel so ill-equipped. I cannot help the young people, young adults beyond a certain level. Tears came. I look at them. I look at them. It's just, we're just stuck. I really don't mind taking a year off work to go over to be trained. I still remember what he said. He said, would you like to be trained for the pastoral ministry? I had no idea what that meant. That's not one year. That is taking a year that is totally changing and saying, okay, serve the Lord full time. Now that was a different story altogether. Would I do it? Wow, oh, much prayer, much seeking the Lord. This is what it takes. Well, I'm going to try. I'm going to really try. All right. 
for the sake of the church, for the sake of the kingdom of God, will you do it? It has been precious. Life lessons, you, you find, you edify. You know, if, to, to, be, to have the privilege and honor to, to be there for people, to see people to the Lord and to see people grow in their faith has been something that has truly this. Remember, all this is out of the grace of God. It is really out of His grace. But these gifts await you to discover them. Don't look at yourself and say, you know what? Ah, I can't be done. It's from the Lord. It's from Him. His gift. His grace. Would you consider this? Would you really consider this? We need more. We really do. We read more to say, you know what? I would like to do this for the sake of the Lord. For the sake of growth. For the sake to see the church grow strong. To see the church weak pains me. To see so much work undone. I've, we've got to do something. Well, that's how I felt too. And I wanted to be equipped. This is why I talk about being equipped. There was so much equipping I needed in my own life. I didn't realize that until it began. And then to be able to serve the Lord and to be part of edifying the church. It can be done. It really can be done. Telling you it can be done because I've seen it in my own life. That's why it can be done. Okay, what has been startling to me is the life of Uncle Clive. That in this six, few five months, his faith grew so significantly. Please, but don't wait till the end kind of a thing. Just take your faith seriously and much can be done. It can be done. That's what he's taught me. And those are the lessons that is going to stay with me. We often think it's just for the young people. Can a person, later years, grow so significantly? God has given us time and opportunity. To just take it seriously. And we will see our own life grow, faith grow so much more. Okay? Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we pray that we would take heed to these words we pray that it would help us to take our faith and take the gifts that you've given to us with greater sense of urgency and belief that it can be done, that we can change, that we can grow, that we can be stronger and we can contribute to the growth of your church. We pray that we will read these words with faith in our heart and the lessons that you are seeking to teach us. We pray that we would respond with faith. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.